Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Hello, I'm Peter O'Toole and today I'm joined by Jeff Lickman at the Harvard University. And today we spoke about the reason he became interested in science. In thinking about biology generally was um, thanks to my father. The first time he saw that world famous image of the rainbow. This amazing, unbelievable picture with no processing. And how his jokes he often tells are completely unintentional. I often give lectures and people say, you're so funny. I say, but I didn't tell any jokes. All in this episode of The Microscopists. Hi, I'm Peter. Hi, Peter. Hi, Jeff. So today I'm joined by Jeff Lickman uh, from Harvard and also, I believe, Professor of Arts and Sciences of the Santiago Ramon y Cajal, I I can't pronounce that at all, uh, museum, I presume. Yes? Uh, No, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, yeah, they have a uh, honorific uh, title, a, a Cajal professor, and I have that. It's, it, it's, impossible to have that and not feel embarrassed <laughs> because Cajal was, of course, the greatest imager in the history of biology, probably, certainly in the history of neuroscience. That's actually, I, I, I've got to say, for those who are not so familiar, Jack, thank you for sending the pictures through. Uh, I think I have a picture, actually, that you sent through. Which is yeah, this is a really interesting picture. This is a picture of Cajal sitting uh, in his workshop where he's staining. He has a number of uh, microscopes, Zeiss microscopes, Zeiss um, achromatic objectives. And for me, the f- my favorite feature of this picture is if you look by the mirror of the microscope he's using and just look to the right of it, you'll see a little glass of sherry. Do you see that? I can't really point on your screen, but yeah, right, yeah. right on, right where, you, right next to your head, there's a little glass of sherry suggesting he was drinking while he was working, and and that's really dangerous when you look at the chemicals <laughs> that he's dealing <laughs> with everywhere there. But with that one proviso, just a truly amazing scientist in every respect. <clears throat> so, so, so you obviously feel very honoured uh, for the position you've been given at the School of Arts and Sciences uh, with his name. And your work has moved into neuroscience. What got you into it to start with? Because were you ever destined, did you, as a child, were you thinking, I'm going to be a neurobiologist? Or where do you start? Um, I guess my my beginnings uh, in thinking about biology generally was um, thanks to my father, Uh, he was a physician, and when he went to medical school uh, back in the 1940s, he's now deceased, um, every uh, physician in training, every medical student had their own microscope that they had to buy uh, so they could learn how to interpret blood smears and urinalysis and the like. And uh, when he uh, became a regular full-fledged physician. Uh, he, he was a hematologist, studied blood, and he got himself a nice microscope. And he gave, he put his medical school uh, Leica microscope uh, in, which was a monocular microscope, but it had oil immersion lenses uh, in the bedroom that my brother and I shared. So from a very early age, I mean, maybe four or five years of age, there was a fancy, really good microscope in our room. And uh, we, uh, I I can't speak for my brother, although he's a pathologist uh, and an immunologist, so it must have rubbed off on him as well. Uh, We just looked at everything, everything you could imagine under that microscope. So I was using a microscope at a reasonably sophisticated level uh, when I was in grade school, you know, looking at paramecia and it, it, virtually everything, every aspect of my growing up 
got scrutinized at the microscopic level. I, everything, you know, from mucus and other bodily secretions, I'm not going to mention, but yeah, everything basically <laughs> was looked at with that microscope. So I took it's it for granted. <laughs> well, say what? That this is being recorded. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, yeah, maybe this should be deleted. But <laughs> in any sense, it was, it was, um, it took, it, it just, I took it for granted that people uh, wanted to know what things looked like when they were small. I, it didn't seem to me a special trait. Uh, but, you know, when I got older and began to use microscopes uh, as a undergraduate student in college, I realized many people were much more clumsy with microscopes uh, than I was. And it wasn't because I had any special facility. It was just that I had one <laughs> since I was a grade age school. So I knew that whatever I did in science, and I was very interested in biology, probably would have a component related to microscopes. I, we didn't use the word imaging back then. I was just looking at things. And then when I went to um, undergraduate school, I did a biochemistry uh, thesis where there was a little bit of imaging, but not much. But then when I went to medical school and began my MD, PhD program, uh, one of my lecturers, though actually in my freshman year in medical school, was Dale Purvis, who was a young assistant professor at the time. He just opened his lab, and he began talking about uh, all the ways the nervous system works, and we got to see pictures of neurons, and I said, this is an area that seems really interesting. Uh, and he was a great teacher, and I think largely because he was so compelling as a teacher, I got into neuroscience. And I never left. Uh, e even after medical school, I decided just to stay as a neuroscience uh, researcher as opposed to taking care of patients. Oh, thanks for staying in it because obviously that's driven, actually not just neuroscience, a lot of the things you've developed have rubbed off into other worlds of the biological and life science field, always around a lot of the application side <clears throat> and the development of new applications using microscopy, whether that be from the brainbow through to now the, the multi-beam SEM, and so the multi-beam sectioning, which we can come to in a little bit. But I have to ask, I have to go back, that first microscope, I bet you don't still have it, do you? Um, it was passed on to uh, my brother's children. So it is still, it's, I don't have it, but it is still being used by young people. Oh, that's cool. Which is a very appealing. I, you know, these microscopes, basically can last forever because they're just tubes and glass, you know, so if you take care of them, they're, they're fine. I suspect it probably needs a good cleaning. I suspect you'll need a wrench now to move the slide, <laughs> the stage mover, because the, the grease has gotten very tight, but, but <laughs> the microscope still works. Oh, and it, you know, it was a 1.3 uh, NA oil immersion 60X lens, 63X lens. It, it was, you know, almost state of the art uh, back then. So it was quite good. I'd like to think about the oil immersion bit. But I suppose it's, I, I presume it's an upright? Yeah, an upright, sure. Yeah. No so, fluorescence. You know, this is a monocular upright microscope. Yeah, I'm sure you can get an LED and a, a, a bit of coloured foil, and they can probably do fluorescence on it today as well, <laughs> for very low cost. Yeah, if your brother's children are inventive <laughs> enough with it, I think. So from... From that, so that's what inspires you to go to move into neurobiology itself. And I was going to ask you what your first microscope was, but that's patently obvious exactly what that was now. Uh, I've got to say, I, I my first microscopes were dreadful. Uh, I really wanted to look down a microscope. I think most children are inquisitive and want to see what's going on, uh, but there was so poor quality uh, for the price range that my parents could afford. And even when I went to university, the microscopes at that level were so poor, I actually hated microscopes. So I just, I couldn't operate them. I could never make, see what I wanted to see. And then I realized it was just the quality of the microscope can make a big difference. Yeah. So I, I definitely lucked out. And I don't even know that my father had any intention here, but it turned out uh, to have impacted both my brother and my future careers, basically. We both use imaging in our <laughs> daily work. So <clears throat> throughout that, so, so obviously you've, you've reached a, the, 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 you know, I, I'm not going to say you're at the peak of your career because you never know where you're going to end up. It can still go up, but yeah, but you're, you're the very highest in your area for science. But it's never easy to get there. So, well, if you what has been the biggest challenge that you've come across in all those years to to get to the pinnacle of your 
You know, I think uh, people who who are in science for the long game um, are people who really can't do anything else. Uh, it's it's not that I'm making strategic decisions about what to do in order to climb a rung on a ladder or to get tenure, to get a paper published in a particular journal. I, I don't think about it that way. I think most scientists who are my age, who are still scientists, have to have some innate uh, pleasure that they get out of doing science. And you have to, of course, be curious. You have to, if you run out of curiosity, basically that's the end. Uh, and I, I think if I have any particular gift, it's that I'm curious. I'm, I'm really interested about things. So it's not been hard. I wouldn't say every step of the way has been easy. In fact, almost everything we do seems technically hard. And that's why there are you know, a lot of things that we've tried to do differently, new technologies. And you've mentioned some that are successful or somewhat successful, but there are many other technologies we have invented that you've never heard of because they, they didn't have legs. They didn't go anywhere. They weren't really that good an idea. Um, but uh, the the fun is in the journey. And I think if, if a person uh, enjoys this kind of work, then it it's not really that hard uh, to keep moving. You just have to have a thick skin for, uh, you know, a patient, occasionally a paper you think is good doesn't get accepted in the journal you think it should be accepted in, or occasionally a really great experiment that you're hoping is going to work doesn't work for technical reasons, and you have to figure out why. But if, if you are willing to bounce back from those kinds of disappointments, uh, I, th I think it is a pretty straight arrow to just staying in the game and you end up okay. Which, which actually comes to, I, I'm shooting ahead in where I was going to go is ask him of these things. We talked about getting some of the work published. Um, sometimes it doesn't get published where you expect it to get or hope it would get published. It, it knocks down and for whatever reason, which can be fairly frustrating sometimes because some of the, some of the best work can be some of the lower perceived lower ranking journals. Uh, certainly. But what is your favorite publication that you've authored or co-authored i'll give you two if you can't think of it, if you can't pick one well i mean it's a no-brainer for me i think if i think about this um and that is i had a very uh fortunate experience as a graduate student i worked in the lab of a very hard-working scientist dale purvis um and he and i participated in a number of experiments that uh, were part of his main mission in the lab, and I helped with. And while I was working on that, um, he suggested I look at a particular ganglion, that uh, a piece of the autonomic nervous system no one had ever looked at before, and I decided, yeah, I'll take a look at this uh, a guy named Santagathy, a very famous uh, scientist from Europe, had suggested to Dale Purvis in a letter that somebody should look at this collection of nerve cells because they're so exposed and accessible. I began looking at them and I saw something there that I thought was quite interesting, which was that they were innervated by only one axon in adults. And I knew that muscle fibers are also only contacted by one axon in adults. So I suggested to him that maybe I could look at whether they're contacted by multiple axons in development as is known to be the case in muscle. That was a recent finding in muscle. And uh, I looked and found that that was the case. And so this was, for me, the first example of a neuron undergoing a rather radical change in its wiring diagram in early postnatal life. And uh, I think uh, this was not his agenda. It was my agenda. And when I wrote up the paper, he said, why don't you publish this by yourself uh, as a graduate student? And I said, I said, is that because you think this is bullshit? He said, no. He said, it wasn't my idea. And you, you know, we've, we've been very helpful. You know, we've got six or seven papers together. So why don't you just uh, publish this by yourself? So I published, I actually sent it to Nature at his uh, suggestion. And over Christmas, I sent it just before the Christmas break. He called me and said they sent it right back, <laughs> that it was too specialized for Nature. So they were not interested. They didn't even review it. So I, it was the first triage paper uh, that I knew. I had. I'd never heard of a paper being sent back without review. 
and it happened to me. And so I was really despondent for a few minutes. And he said, send it to the Journal of Physiology. So I sent it to the Journal of Physiology and got very good reviews. And I then went to a meeting and described that result. And there was a nature uh, reporter at the meeting who then wrote a, like a news and views about this, my result. And then when that was published in Nature, I said, why was the original not interesting enough for Nature? <laughs> report of it was. So it all ended up very nicely. But I am extremely grateful to my mentor for this. But the idea of having my thesis published, uh, and I wrote two papers, both in journal physiology that where I was sole author as a graduate student is unique. I mean, I, it's hard for me to imagine doing allowing that to happen to one of my graduate students working with me. <laughs> so it's even more impressive to see the generosity of my uh, mentor back then. And so that paper has a very special place for me. Uh, that, that's a great story as well. Uh, just, just to the rejection of, and, and then how it's been well <laughs> before we, every, once it was out there. It was interesting, the sole authorship question, because that's less and less the case now. I think, you know, I, I think there's an acceptance that teamwork and very few, very few publications come from one person doing absolutely everything from concept to maturing it and optimizing it to actually publishing it. And Quite often, I think it is team science now, but what's your feelings? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's, it's, it's not just one person. It's rarely even the case, at least in my field, that one laboratory has the expertise to generate a paper that's acceptable to journals that have a pretty high bar of what's acceptable, that you need more expertise than exists in a lab. No lab is really good at everything, but most papers now require... Uh, everything. They require maybe molecular analysis and animal behavior in the same paper, but behaviorists are not molecular biologists, so you can't do that in one lab easily. So I think this has changed a lot, this idea of a kind of collaborative science, and you probably know that it's not just uh, that there's one first author now, sometimes there are two or three first yeah. authors, and, and the fight is who is the first first author, and at the other end, the senior authors, <laughs> it's not just one, but there are several senior authors and they also have to be put in the right order. And in between, there's a host of people who did small parts of these projects. So I think this is the reality and it, it makes for a kind of science that is somewhat unsettling in the sense that no one who writes or is a participant in a study like this can attest to the quality of every single thing done in that paper. Whereas when I was the sole author of a paper published in Journal of Physiology, the buck started and stopped with me. I, I knew everything. There was no one else uh, to blame for anything that was wrong. Now it's very complicated and none of these papers are fully understood by everyone who is a co-author. And that is a weird situation, I think. So, so my next question now, I don't wanna to go too serious, but I, I think it's quite an important point. I think team science is really important. I think that is what we're doing, and I think that is the right way to do it. But I also, when you see papers rejected because they've missed an area out, or could you now go on to do this? Well, that's kind of the next research project, but they're asking for it to be done for that publication. I, what's your feelings on that? Again, I got very strong feelings about this. I think what used to be a career worth of experiments is now often jam-packed in single papers. And these papers have to have 10 or 15 supplementary figures to cover all the ground necessary to get the, into a journal where uh, that's necessary. And, and, and I think the reason for this is it can kind of fascinating. I think it's a kind of sociological phenomenon that the reviewers, who are just people like me and you, you know, we just, we always take as our benchmark of quality how we were treated. So as soon as some reviewer asks us to do extra, then when we review papers, we assume that's now the common level. And so there's only one direction things go. They get increasingly impossible. So how, a paper, do, we how do we go back to where good science gets published and you, you don't have to have answered everything? You can leave a question for someone else to answer. So, I, you know, one possibility is that the democratization of publishing, that is, there are all sorts of places one can publish 
that are not just uh, the name brand high uh, visibility journals means that papers don't have to be everything to everyone to still be published. Also, a remarkable change is bioarchive uh, for biologists, where uh, we are now, and I think most labs I know, are submitting their, not submitting, putting their papers before they submit, and they get a lot of feedback. And those papers often, that feedback can be used uh, in the letter to the editor of how much interest this paper in its present form <laughs> has engendered. It doesn't guarantee anything, but it gives you some sense of confidence that the people who have read it already say this paper is good, but it would be more useful if you did this. And so there are reviewers who really, they're not reviewing it because they're trying to get the paper rejected. They're reviewing it because they're interested in the subject. So bioarchive, I think, has been a force for, for good, definitely. Yeah, and I will... I will caveat both our feelings. I, I, I completely agree, but I, I'd also caveat, I think there are some publications, I can think of things like Nature Methods that don't ask the world. It needs to be bulletproof, but it's, it doesn't ask for absolutely everything. It, it's, it's to invent the method. I, I like those, the newer journals that have come out to address just that concern, which is great for the technology side, but maybe when you're actually solving a scientific question, they're the ones that have the, more, the higher barrier, maybe the higher bar to, to get yeah. over at that point. Uh, so that was your favorite publication. What about your career highlight? My career highlight. Someone points out to me once that my career highlight was probably my gray hair at the side, but I, I disagree with them. <laughs> this is what I earned. <laughs> I think this is a, maybe a psychological uh, phenomenon that it always seems to me the next thing, the thing we're trying to get out now is the ultimate. That's the thing that is finally going to really do it. It's going to make a case for something. And so I'm, I, I don't, and maybe in a few more years when I can't do science because my brain is melted, I'll be looking backwards. But at the moment, my highlight is that next paper, uh, whatever it is. And right now, you know, we're working, well, you probably don't know, we're working on a very, very large data set um, from human brain that came out of that multi-beam microscope, two, 2,000 terabytes of data. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that paper. And I'm thinking that will be the highlight. But you know, when Brainbow came out, that was the highlight. And when I first saw synapse elimination as a graduate student, that was the highlight. It's always, it's always whatever I'm doing, I think that's the highlight. <laughs> Which is good. If, if you're always looking back, that's not good. Yeah. So you're always looking forward. 2,000. 2,000 terabyte, did you say? 2,000 terabytes, yeah. So, okay, now we're going to talk about team working. Surely that's going to be someone like Google that you're working with. It is with. Google. So we are working with Google, with Varen Jane's uh, remarkable team there. And um, don't ask me why Google is so generous. Uh, I think it's partly because it's hard and they like hard problems. Um, but they have uh, really, really stepped up in a data set that requires an enormous amount of effort. And it's, uh, it's miraculous what they've done. It's truly amazing to see all these neurons and synapses completely wired up. It, it's like the Golgi stain or like Brainbow, but at four nanometer lateral resolution. So, so I'll come back to this in a moment, but just thinking about the neurons, I can see on your screen behind you, that you've got neurons. However, that that looks like an Apple uh, PC, and I'm guessing that isn't your office. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I don't use Apple products mostly because many of the programs we have don't run on the Mac operating system. This is not my office. Um, I don't know whose office this is. I envy this person who has an office in the corner, if you look behind me, you see it's a corner office overlooking a river, I think maybe the Hudson River, I don't know. I'm in a dingy little bedroom right now, <laughs> but I couldn't, but the room didn't seem like my own office until I Photoshopped some neurons. Those are actually human neurons from this project we're doing with Google on the screen. And I also put a Diet Coke uh, back there too. I, I'm addicted to Diet Coke, so I, I, I feel comfortable in this office. <laughs> and uh, 
So, so, so is this your office? Is this your true office? Yes, that's my true office. Not this time of year, but probably yeah, in February or January, a year or two ago. I've got to say that does look. Uh, yeah, that the uh, yes, and you get proper snow. We very 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 rarely get proper snow these days, and yeah, we used to get proper snow. We'll see as, as the uh, climate changes whether we'll continue to get it. Um, the thing in that office is that I, as you notice, I'm facing away from the window. Uh, and that's for the obvious reason that if I was facing the other way, I'd get nothing done. It's just really a beautiful view of <laughs> that room. So I face away and people who visit me, which is now never, no one ever comes to my office, including me. I haven't been in my office for six months, thanks to COVID, um, face out and I face inward to a much more boring scene. Like I said, then, but that looks like an apple as well. Yeah. That was an Apple computer. I see there's no Dell sign on it. But there was a time where I, I needed um, about two, uh, I needed a solid state disk with two terabytes at least, and I needed 64 gigabytes of RAM to make a laptop run powerfully. And there was no uh, laptop that was not, that didn't weigh 20 pounds uh, that would do that, that was a PC. So I, I took a, a Macintosh uh, laptop and I stripped out the operating system and turned it into a Windows machine. But now I'm back to uh, PCs because PCs have, have the power that I need. And you said you had Adele at home. Well, I'd love to meet Adele. I think her music is brilliant. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> that was really bad, wasn't it? Yes. So, so thinking of working hard. Uh, ah. Yeah, so, so uh, who's this? So this is uh, the most amazing animal I know, uh, maybe even including human beings. Um, that is Minnie. Actually, Minerva is her real name. She's a Glen of Emal Terrier. You've probably never heard of a Glen of Emal. I-M-A-A-L. It's an Irish terrier breed. Pretty uncommon <clears throat> because they look so funny. You can already tell, uh, just looking at that dog, that its head is gigantic. It's got a gig really, like really big, big, yeah, really, really big head. Um, it, it actually looks a lot like an Irish wolfhound. And if you know anything about Irish wolfhounds, they're the size of small horses. And Minnie is, a Glen of Amal is just like an Irish wolfhound, except its legs are only this big. So it's a gigantic dog on very, very small legs. And... I'll what that, that means, uh, it's, it's really interesting, I think, from a neurobiological standpoint. It has this gigantic brain, but very little amount of body to use it for. So that brain is being used for other things. And I think it's mainly not being used to plan for the future. It's not a, I wouldn't call it an intellectual dog in that sense, but its emotional valences are very, very large. It has every possible human emotion and a bunch of emotions that I don't think humans have. And it's very vocal. So it's constantly making weird noises of satisfaction, anger, boredom, does a lot of sighing, you know, all sort of yawning, uh, whining. It's just constantly making noise. And it's completely taken over our household. My wife and I... Um, spend much of our food budget keeping the dog fed because it's very food interested. And uh, yeah, we spend a lot of time walking it and just taking care of it. What sort of places do you go walking with Minnie? Well, in Cambridge, where we live, Cambridge, United States, um, there's a dog park near where I live just a half a block away. So every morning for her whole life, we got her when she was nine or 10 weeks of age. Uh, by a, a, we didn't know anything about this breed. It's not like I'm a dog fancier or anything. Um, so I go to this dog park, and she's gone every, almost every day her whole life. And she's now nine years old. So she owns that park. <laughs> it's a, a dog park. It's, a, it's just a regular park. It's not a dog park. But dogs are allowed off leash in the morning uh, between 6 and 9 a.m. And so she and her friends play around, used to. Most of her friends who were older than her are now dead. It's a very sad thing about dogs because they, they grow up so much faster than human beings. But 
So now she goes to the park and chews on her squeaky ball uh, while the puppies run around her a lot. <laughs> She'll occasionally run, but she's not nearly as uh, running as she used to be, where she would get covered with mud and play every day. They said she's a... Uh... She, she likes her food or very interested in food. What about yourself? What sort of food do you like? Oh, I love pasta, which is not good because I could eat a pound of pasta in one sitting, <laughs> but I don't anymore. Um, but that's the only uh, food I can actually cook reasonably well. Anyone who knows anything about cooking knows cooking pasta is not that hard. Making well, pasta is hard. <laughs> You can overdo it with cooking, but I I am an al, al dente type of guy, so I undercook the pasta slightly, and I love pasta. Uh, my wife is uh, Italian descent, um, so she tolerates pasta, but she thinks I overdo it, as does everyone else who knows me. That you shouldn't eat that much pasta, but I now basically I eat almost nothing all day, and then I have pasta for dinner. So, so here's a question: Would you rather eat in? Or would you rather eat out? Well, it's not really much of a question right now, I guess. Yeah, in normal times. <laughs> now, in normal times, uh, we rarely eat out. But in normal times, we used to almost every week have food delivered, take in. Okay, um, take away. Uh, and we haven't even done that. Uh, and it's terrible because I know these restaurants are suffering terribly. But we're now uh, cooking for ourselves. My wife is fortunately a truly masterful cook, um, but I'm not, I'm not. And, you know, Chinese food or pizza, I'd be happy to have somebody deliver it in. But I used to get to do that only when she was too busy that she couldn't cook. Uh, I think pizza is probably my, uh, my favorite food. So going back to your, your role at the moment at Harvard, you obviously still do a lot of teaching as well. So it's not just research. So what do you prefer now? Do you prefer the teaching or the research? Or is that an unfair question because you love both? I think I, the, the latter is the truth. Uh, maybe more than is good for me as a researcher, I really do love to teach. I love to explain things. And uh, it's hard to explain things. I teach the introductory uh, neuro course in the fall, uh, which has this year 178 students in it. Um, and it's a, it's a hard course to teach because I have to teach synaptic potentials, resting potential, action potentials, and I don't dumb it down. I teach them everything there is to know about equilibrium potentials, the Goldman-Hodgkin-Katz equation, and so on and so forth. All the details of conduction of action potentials, cable properties of neurons, and uh, I try to teach it without mathematics, which makes it even uh, more challenging uh, to describe and explain these things. And this year, even more challenging because I'm not teaching it live. The students are spread out over the whole world. And so there's no time zone where the entire class can listen at the same time. So I've recorded these lectures. And then we have a synchronous Friday. We had it this morning, actually, where the students bring questions. They, ha they get credit for bringing questions. So there were 177 questions uh, about cable properties <laughs> today. And getting students to understand membrane capacitance uh, who have never, who don't know what a capacitor is, is a, a true challenge. But I love trying. Uh, I use analogies like leaky hoses to try to teach people how capacitors work and how leak channels and membranes work. Actually, on, on the, I mean, it's just, just purely out of interest, Ed, do they have their cameras on when they talk to you or do they keep their cameras off? Um, we, we suggest that if they can, they put their camera on. And usually when they ask a question, they turn their camera on. But there are a number of students who, for one reason or another, uh, bandwidth is one of the reasons and another reason is maybe where they are. Uh, they would prefer not to uh, have the camera on. Uh, the virtual background in Zoom really does help, uh, but there's still situations where just the lighting of the room prevents a virtual background from yeah. working. So there's no requirement uh, that students have cameras on. There, there are sections. This, we have 15 sections, so the heads, the teaching fellows and teaching assistants who do the sections, 
in those smaller rooms, I think the encouragement is stronger that the students actually show themselves so that they can have a conversation. But in a class my size, you know, with 170 yeah, it's, it's, plus it's, students, what difference does it yeah. make? Yeah. I guess if they ask a question, then, then they'll pop up and... Right. Ask when they them. ask a question, they almost always show up in person. So how many of these students have... A, a, you have a citizen science project as well, I think, or have been involved in some citizen science? in helping process the data uh, through iWire, I think I read somewhere. I yeah, know iWire is mainly um, the brainchild of Sebastian Sung, who used to be at MIT and is now uh, at Princeton, I think has just actually moved temporarily at least, or maybe forever to Samsung in Korea where he directs research. So that was his idea, sort of crowdsourcing of tracing and that's been very successful. And we've participated in that a little bit, but I can't take any credit for that. That was his idea. But have any of you students participated or helped or go along with it? Um, it's, you know, for us, it's absolutely essential in order to get uh, images like the one you're seeing there, where every, in that case, it's all the axons in a little volume. That's what it says up in the corner. That's a little volume where all the axons, all the dendrites, all the glial cells were labeled. Um, to get that done, uh, it requires a lot of human tracing. And, and once you have good human tracing, you can use this as classifiers for automatic uh, segmentation. But when that picture was taken, we didn't have very good machine learning yet. Uh, and so you have to have ways of getting human beings to participate. And it's time consuming and it takes a lot of effort. And we have taken advantage in my lab, not so much citizen science as undergraduate uh, pre-med student to science where uh, students help us uh, participate in these things, sometimes generate a, a thesis for their uh, undergraduate thesis. And all we can do in return basically is write letters of recommendation to get help them get into um, postgraduate schools like medical school, which for Harvard students, you know, both the, this helps, but it's never necessary. These are all good students pretty much. So the, the image we just saw in this sort of image, so to us, it's one of the famous rainbow images itself. I, I, I always, I'm curious actually, and it'd be interesting to see what your thought is on this as well. I think a lot of undergraduates, when they're coming through 18, 19 years of age, 20, they're seeing these sort of images, but they're so used to virtual reality. They're so used to everything being computer generated. Whether they realize that this is a real biological image, or whether it's just a computer generated, you know, sort of image itself. Do you have similar thoughts or, or concern? I, I, I get concerned about it because I, I think they come to us and they, when they come to do their PhD, they have no idea what they can do with a microscope. They still think it's black and white drawing under a microscope. So uh, one, of, one of the highlights of my career, you were asking about the highlight, but one of them was the first time Jean LeVay, who developed Rainbow, um, was showing me on the confocal a, a sample of brain. It could have been a hippocampus like this. I think it actually was cerebral cortex, but it's very similar, where he first uh, scanned the section with a uh, laser light that activated the red fluorescent protein. So you got an image that was red of neurons. And then he turned on the green fluorescent protein laser light, which is blue color light, and then superimposed on top of the red were uh, green cells and a certain number of cells that were yellow or various shades of yellow where there was green plus blue. And then he turned on the blue laser light and out came this third channel. And suddenly this amazing, unbelievable picture with no processing, just three channels superimposed generated this myriad of colors. And that was really wonderful to see. Uh, and I, I do, I remember that moment quite clearly, because it was the first time I'd ever seen anything that looked like that. This was really quite astonishing to me. Um, now, I think we're a little jaded because computer science can take, for example, electron microscopic images and do exactly the same thing post hoc uh, through machine learning. And so you get exactly the same effect, only better in the sense that we have a data set now with 42,000 cells in it, and every cell has a unique color, basically. Everyone, it has its own signature. 
So whereas with Brainbow, maybe you have 50 colors, you know, to have 42,000 colors and every cell is a uniquely identified object and all the synapses are there and it's, you know, just, it's, <laughs> it makes the highlight reel of Brainbow seem a little unimpressive, actually. Uh, when you start seeing what electron microscopy can do for you. Maybe a bit harsh, but <laughs> and that's, uh, so the EM, so that's using the multi-beam setup. And so I've got to ask, I think last time you had 32 or 64 beams. Is it still set at that or have you got more beams? We have 61 beams. There is a 91 beam out there uh, with one more. It's a hexagonal array of beams. And so... If you add one more array of beams around the outside, you get to 91 beams. Um, and as soon as we can figure out a way to afford the extraordinary expense of such a device, we definitely want one. Um, because that will speed our image acquisition, which is our bottleneck right now. So it's the acquisition that's the bottleneck, not the analysis? It used to be that, oh, you know, no matter how slowly you image it, it's going to take you years to segment it and stuff. But the segmentation, thanks to teams like uh, Burren Jane's team at Google and Sebastian Sung's team at Princeton, have figured out really, really powerful and efficient algorithms that if you give it enough training data, they can do this job quite quickly. So the stitching, alignment, segmentation, synapse identification, which were almost impossible to imagine that they could be done by machine, are now uh, automated. And I would say it's not like it's not bumpy. There's still issues, but those issues are evaporating very quickly. Whereas the image acquisition uh, is rate limited by the number of machines we have. Because <clears throat> we can s sort of disperse our data on many machines. So if I had 20 multi-beams, you know, projects that take six months could be done in a couple of days. So, so, so what I think what's scary for me is you'd have to, this expensive microscope and we're, we're talking millions uh, of dollars to, to get uh, a 91 beam system in. Chances are it would only be used probably by your own group because that's the rate limiting step is the image acquisition. So unlike many, like, like the cryo-electron microscopes are really ex are big expensive microscopes, but they're used by lots of researchers to look at different questions. In this case, this is one giant nutcracker to solve one nut. In this case, obviously, it could be used for many other applications. Actually, um, it's not exactly that, <clears throat> in the sense that we uh, received from the BRAIN initiative of the NIH a grant, it's a U24 grant, that allowed us to open our facility to other users if there's spare capacity between times we're doing big runs. And we've already run 20 different laboratory samples through our pipeline. Mo most people's samples are much smaller than the samples we run, so they go in and out reasonably quickly. Um, and we're doing, we're continuing to do that. We have lots of samples. So I have everything from octopus to um, hypothalamus, spinal cord, uh, worms, you know, things that are not in my own personal research center that we're running through these machines. Uh, although we only have one machine. If I had no, more machine, we could do more good in, in that realm. And I'd you know, love to be able to convince the NIH it would be in their best interest. Because if you just uh, delivered a 91 beam machine to a lab that has no experience with it, they're not going to get anything out of it. It's just so there's so many steps still that have that it's hard. These are very sophisticated machines and very different in that sense, perhaps, than um, the cryo EM machines, which are more like standard confocals now. You know, you need a certain amount of expertise, but it's the tissue preparation is learnable. Here, every sample needs its own staining. Uh, you have to figure out how to cut it thin. You've got to make for the multi-beam, the way we do it, at least wafers, and got to put the sections on wafers. There's all these technical steps that make it challenging. So I think one way to do this is to use a facility like ours, and not as a collaborator. Basically, it's the government is paying for their use of the facility. So, so 
we, we spoke about this looking like art and this, I, I'm not sure you've even seen this. I believe this might be a picture of what, from one of your students themselves. Who is that? I don't even know who that is. Who is that? Yeah, they get away, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I don't see that as looking like me. It just doesn't look like well, it. This, uh, so Suzanne uh, sent me this earlier <laughs> today and said, oh, you've got to put this up. And uh, it was rather last minute. So it's kind of cool. But this is art, but you also, uh, so this is in the gallery, is that correct? Uh, this is at the MIT Museum when Ramoni Cajal's traveling exhibit uh, came to Boston. And it was fantastic. I, I had seen many of these, uh, virtually every one of these images in books and things. But to see the originals and see how fine, he must have used a microscope to draw them. I mean, the fineness of the pen he was using uh, and the control, every dendritic spine of a, per, of a Purkinje cell. There's a very famous Purkinje cell that he drew that everybody knows and you, you assume it must be this gigantic drawing. It's only this big. <laughs> you almost need a magnifying glass. In fact, I don't think you can see them there, but they handed out magnifying glass so you could look at his drawings with a magnifier because he draw, drew such fine lines. Just fantastic. Truly microscopic drawings. Then. Yeah, really. Like <laughs> it was almost real size. <laughs> well with it. And, and this image? So that is Daniel Berger I'm standing there with, and this is serial electron microscopy where every synaptic vesicle in every nerve terminal is labeled, that's those white dots. And you're seeing a whole bunch of axons making synapses on a pyramidal apical dendrite in red. So the red thing is the dendrite, and right in the center there, there's a green blob uh, filled with vesicles making a synapse right on a dendritic spine. Uh, and uh, Daniel is a master. He, he, he made some of the tracing tools we use, a, a, a software called VAST that's used widely. And he is also just a master at rendering. So he got enough transparency in here. So these objects look like sort of stained glass that are transparent. So you could see through the membranes uh, with these light colors in to see the synaptic vesicles and even see through them to see the dendrites. Uh, just fantastically beautiful drawing. <clears throat> it's not a drawing, a, a computer rendering yeah. thing. And it was in, the, and, and the crazy thing is you have all these true masterpieces of Cajal. And then at the end, they throw in a couple of modern pictures like this one. And you know, for us, that's deeply, it made us feel really great, but uh, we know where Cajal stands in the pantheon, <laughs> where we stand. We're, we're amateurs by, his, by comparison. Yeah, I, I think that's harsh. I, I think he had an open field and, and, you, and developed it really well, which inspired a ge generations beyond that. Yeah. But then it's even harder to make your name and make your career because it's so much more competitive. So I, I, I wouldn't tend to do yourself. Uh, so this is... Is this your group, research group, or interns, or? That's a group of interns, yeah. As I said, this tracing is a, a central feature of doing a lot of our work, and many of these interns uh, were helping us with tracing. Um, the person right in the middle, Elise Parverano, who's got a uh, light blue shirt on, uh, is now a graduate student in the program in neuroscience at Harvard, so uh, she had a nice landing from... She was a master's student from Germany, I think Italian by birth, and now she's in the program in neuroscience here. Yeah, they're all terrific. I mean, a number of these people uh, have really transformed what we did because while they're tracing, they keep their minds open. They see things that we've never seen before and they bring them to our attention and that has really changed uh, the way we think about lots of this, a lot, a lot of the things we're doing. So we're extraordinarily grateful. So thinking about the lab itself, can you think of uh, maybe the funniest moment you've had at work, whether that be in the lab or conference or wherever, but work related? I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I can think of something that was deeply embarrassing, um, but I didn't know at the time until in retrospect. There was a, I, w I was teaching in a summer course at Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, um, and they were preparing uh, for the 4th of July. Uh, they take a 
time off in the morning and have a float related each each part of the of the community there gets involved in the 4th of July parade. 4th of July is another big American yeah. holiday and they said I should dress up as GFP. And I said, "Oh, it sounds funny since this was at rainbow time." So I wore a sort of green um green scrubs and someone put a green shower cap on my head and I don't know what else was green but I looked absolutely ridiculous and terrible and I didn't know because I was I didn't look in a mirror or anything and they took pictures of me and a lot of people have this picture uh I hope to god Suzanne didn't send you a copy no I haven't got that picture I, oh good I'm so happy <laughs> <laughs> I so wish I had actually Jeff no wait a minute no, I'm joking. I haven't really. <laughs> My heart stopped for a second. I just look awful. I mean, really, I look like a crazy person. And I look kind of serious in the picture, like I thought I was really GFP or something. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. So, yeah, I, I think that was maybe my most embarrassing. <laughs> Sounds like good fun, though. <laughs> Thinking of... You're not me. <laughs> some... some Quick questions for you. Your fondest time, would it have been being an undergraduate, PhD, postdoc, or being a, a, a group leader? Uh, I think without question, the most exciting time in my life uh, was when I was in a laboratory as a graduate student. I had a feeling you were going to say that. It was just, uh, you know, the only thing that held me back was the number of hours in a day. And, and that was, you know, there, I had very few complications to work hard. Um, nowadays, you know, I got to really find time to do things. But back then, uh, time was, I it could use as much time as I wanted. And yeah, I was productive uh, because of that. And I just, it turned me into something that I was not when I entered graduate school. So slap me down if I'm completely wrong. But I'll be guessing also that you don't spend much time in the lab anymore. And most of your time is actually writing, getting the grants and directing and leading in many other areas and ad administration parts as well. Is that correct? I mean, the sad truth of the matter is that many of the manually challenging steps in the kind of work I do, I don't do anymore. And it, it, it's not that I don't want to, I just don't for one reason or another. But I am uh, fixated on seeing the data. And, and for me, the data is the raw results. I, when students give me a histogram of a result, but don't show me the data upon which it's based, I have to see, I have to understand for myself what these images are. And it's very different from the good old days. When I was a student, you know, you did a lot of hunting and pecking in the microscope itself. You, you didn't even have a scanning microscope. You know, we built a spinning disc confocal uh, that was real time. I did that just so I could watch as I was moving the stage around to find things that were interesting. And there was a lot of bias based on what you're looking for something and you move around till you find it. Nowadays, of course, um, the modern confocal microscopes and the EM microscopes, you, we're not doing that at all. We do this kind of shoot first and ask questions later, as uh, Josh Morgan and I said in a paper. Uh, as opposed to looking for something interesting to take a picture of and, and shoot. Um, and so now we have a much more unbiased data set to look at, and I want to look at those data sets. So when students uh, generate data, I, I want to see it. So I spend a lot of time um, looking, sharing, the students share with me now with Zoom, sharing the screen, and we play through stacks of images and we zoom up and lab meetings we have, we just have one person per lab meeting present and they present for two hours. And during those two hours, I expect that they will show the raw data and we discuss the quality of the data. And I, I, if I don't do that, I'm not happy. I don't want to see just graphs. I want to see the original data the before the graphs. So you are, uh, it's interesting, you have the lab meeting, but I, I so I meet with my PhD student once a week, uh, try to meet once a week, but I really like it when they just drop in with a new result. Rather than waiting, I do like that, come and tell me as you're going along, just, just drip feed it. 
and, and come with the excitement. So I guess my office door is open at that point rather than closed, even though there's things going on, sometimes you can't see them. What about yourself? Are you an off, a, a open office or a please book a time type office? I, I completely agree with you. Nothing is more pleasurable than someone interrupting to say, yeah, you've got to see this, and they come in and show you something. Um, again, the reality is that because I teach and I'm on committees, etc., Sometimes a student will come to the door and they can't come in because someone else is in there or I'm on the phone. And that really bothers me. And I, I think that's why I said before teaching, maybe I like it too much for my own good in the sense that it's t sapping time away from what is, I think, my primary mission. Harvard would probably disagree. They say, you know, they're paying me to be a teacher and a researcher, not in a particular order. Both of those things are equally important or perhaps nine months of teaching and three months, summer months of research is what they would like. But most of us biologists, you know, are full-time researchers and we put the teaching in at the same time as much as possible. And I, I love teaching, but it does make it harder for students to be very spontaneous, even though I don't have, I, there's nothing on my door say. In fact, I have a, thanks to Suzanne, my lab manager, I have a, my door is glass. So a student can stand there and just stare at me while I'm on the phone. And then I say, I have to get off the phone because somebody's staring at me. So I can't hide from my students. No blind on the door? No, nope. there is a blind, but it, it's only down when I have a grant that's due or something. But now it's irrelevant with COVID. Yeah, yeah, this, no, it is. So okay, coming back to outside of work life, uh, are you a book or TV person? Uh, I am a TV person, absolutely. I I don't read. I read, yeah, you know, almost nothing. I read some things, but almost nothing. Yeah, for pleasure. I'm with you on that. Are you a TV or film person? Um, what I've discovered is that these long format uh, TV shows that are where the episodes form a very long story. Um, there are Dickens novels that are now, Dickens novels were serialized, you know, they basically came out in pieces. There's a lot of television now like that. And I love that form. Uh, I, so it's like movies, but these are movies that last 18 hours. So you really get to know the characters well. And if it's on a good story, uh, including Dickens and uh, George Eliot and uh, sort of classic things like that, but modern ones, we just finished a uh, 40 hours of Detective Montalbano in Italian with subtitles, thank God, uh, which was really fascinating, really wonderful. I got to see what Sicily looks like. And, you know, after 40 hours in Sicily, you really know the place. <laughs> but if you like Dickens, you need to come to York because we have the medieval and Victorian streets still intact. It does, right. look like, it does just look like Dickens yeah. as you walk through the streets. So not all of them. I don't live in a Dickens house. <laughs> There's a few streets still in the main city itself, for its, uh, city itself itself. When it comes to TV, what's your vice? What, what's the trashiest TV you watch then? Uh, well, we just finished, yet last night we just finished five years of uh, a, a show called Friday Night Lights. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's, it's about football in Texas, high school football in Texas. And it's, it's just melodramatic. Um, but yeah, it was good. <laughs> so my advice is uh, things that uh, resonate emotionally. I don't like, um, I, even though I'm a naturalist, I don't watch too many nature shows. I don't watch history shows. I like uh, to be manipulated by the... <laughs> <laughs> director and by good actors so so coming back so we're nearly at the at the hour mark i i fear <clears throat> I, I i've got two more points to come to the first one is on a serious note <clears throat> what's the next big challenge what's the next big technology development or an unmet need that you see <clears throat> throw the so I, line to everyone yeah, out there no i i, I, I don't need to do I mean, I'm going to say something that I think many people would disagree with, um, that we are leaving the age of understanding and entering the age of information. 
Uh, and I see understanding and information as antagonists. That when we had very little data, it was easy to have an understanding or an idea of how something works. And the biggest enemy for that kind of understanding is actual big data because it, it provides you with so much more than you ever imagined biology could provide. And scientists have to come to grips with the fact you can't just verbally explain the connectome of a whole animal, a mouse or a worm. I mean, you know, we're trying to help uh, promote the idea of doing a whole mouse's brain's connectome. That's not going to be understood in any sense of the word. It could be described, but it can't be understood. And most scientists begin and end every talk with what we're trying to understand is and what we now understand. I think that's going to be outdated language. So that's I think the biggest challenge is what do you replace understanding with when you just have big data sets? What is the alternative to understanding? But do you not think that that will create the next part of understanding? Once you've got all that information and you've got it there, do you not think people will delve down into that information to find new, new questions to solve the answers to within that data set? I think the problem is that the complexity of the things we're trying to understand transcend the thought processes of a human brain. I think that's the problem. It's, it's not uh, that there really is understanding there. It's that the complexity of the system is beyond understanding. If I say to you, do you understand London? You say, what do you mean by that? That's crazy. There's just so much going on in London. What do you mean? I mean there's millions of people. There are all these streets and every different kind of house. If you think that's complicated, think of a brain. It's way more complicated than that. You can't understand it. You know, it's just, it, it's ill-posed to say, can you understand it? You can't understand London. You're never going to understand a human brain. But you can understand so, parts of London. Could you? But, you can under, but, but, so, but connectomics and other fields like genomics, which try to give you entire data sets, omics style data sets, are not there to understand the three-dimensional structure of one molecule and how it interacts with another or how one synapse works. It's to try to understand how you get an emergent property, property like behavior out of this vastly complicated network. I don't know how you get there by this reductive approach. I think you'd ha you have to confront the data on the level at which it exists. It was designed to work as a network. So you have to think about it as a network, but it's not a network that's trivial. It's a network with insane numbers of parts that do many different things simultaneously all over the brain. So. Quite literally mind blowing. I, I think. Yes. It would be. <laughs> and on that pun, I've got to ask you: What is your best science joke? And if you don't have a good science joke, what is your best joke? Come on, give it us. Ay ay ay. You know, I think the joke's on me, really. Here, in the sense that I often give lectures, and people say you're so funny, and I say, but I didn't tell any jokes. They said it was filled with jokes. I said. I was serious. <laughs> I don't actually, I'm not a funny person. I'm by nature, I'm dead serious. But for some reason, people think I'm telling jokes all the time. I've never, I hardly ever told a joke in my whole life. I really, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give you a good answer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, actually, be warned here, because when people get cross with me sometimes, I sometimes think they're just joking, and that's my defense mechanism. So maybe all these people think, Maybe you're really cross with them. It's just their defense thinking, oh, it's just joking. That's quite funny. <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. Anyway, Jeff, thank you very much for taking your time uh, with me today to talk. It was a pleasure, it's Peter. Fantastic. I really enjoyed um, talking to you. And I, I hope everyone really enjoys this in a big way because I've this has been a thrill. Uh, thank right, you. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Stay well. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Microscopists a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.